leads up to the final stage of sentencing, especially in cases of serious crimes. The, the procedure is no different from the systems that we are familiar with. And it's clearly identified. Uh, the onus is on the state to prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. The principle of punishment in Islam is not the seeking of vengeance. An accused is entitled to the benefits of the slightest doubt in the evidence against him. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, commands the judge in the words, to err on the side of clemency is better than to err on the side of punishment. In other words, no stone must be left unturned in giving him a fair trial, an opportunity to be heard in all respects, because the sentence is a severe one, and obviously the application of that sentence is only in the last resort. Now, 1400 years ago, uh, the death penalty applied to murder, to um, highway robbery, to treason or apostasy, and to adultery. But you'd be interested to know that 19th century England, the death penalty applied to 227 offenses. So when we look at the span of time, the consistency of the sentences is purely that they are related, they're confined to four only, and that too, on the aspect of, for example, murder, the the element of retribution or the involvement of the victims or those who suffered as a result of the uh, deprivation of the bread owners or breadwinners, they have a say in the sentence. And if they want to forgive, the sentence then is suspended. A death sentence is not passed. On the question of the theft, for example, it's only when the person, all measures have been examined carefully. Um, there is a society that is economically developed. Provisions have been made. There was absolutely no reason or justification for that person to steal. Crimes of theft and robbery stems from poverty and the need to survive, especially in societies burdened with unemployment, lack of education, and basic living necessities such as housing, water, and electricity. The lack of these basic living conditions work against the implementation of Sharia law. I think there are many stages of development in a society. And at appropriate times, certain social, judicial measures need to be implemented in society. Sharia ought to be implemented towards the latter stage of development of any community, I believe. One needs to ensure that the prerequisites are in place. Like Khalif Umar, he ensured that every man, woman and child had a stipend, not just in his immediate vicinity, throughout the regions over which he reigned. And that if it wasn't a monthly grant, there was an annual grant in place. Before any penal code could be implemented on that particular community, he ensured that the basic needs were met. So if we look at the penal code, for example, we cannot implement the cutting off of hands because somebody has stolen something. We have to ensure that the basic social needs of that person is met before we ask for people to start cutting off hands of people. So this is important in the Sharia, in the stage of development for a community and the timing in which it is implemented in the community is critical and that the basic needs ought to be met. Technically speaking, what needs to implement Sharia and especially penal code, hypothetically perhaps, in a community that is free of need and want. And understanding human nature, people would strive to satisfy their needs. Sometimes, unfortunately, not through the best ways possible. That is a reality, one cannot ignore that. And therefore, one needs to work firstly towards a society that is not impoverished, a society that appreciates the dignity of labor, a society that is able to sustain itself, to work towards morality, equality, dignity, social justice, distributive justice. It is only at that stage that I think the penal code of Sharia can become applicable across the board if one achieves those basic stages of development in that community. When the Caliph Omar 
who was the second caliph of Islam, entered Jerusalem, there was fear on the part of the communities that were living there that there would be a, a persecution. But the Charter of Omar stands out as a document that would present to communities worldwide the fairness of Islam, the justice of Islam, the humane system that it presented. And even when the patriarch offered Omar to pray in the church, he preferred to pray outside, saying that one day, if I prayed inside one day, perhaps Muslims may want to claim this church. So the Charter of Omar is the best example and the earliest example of the Sharia in the application of rule between Muslims and non-Muslims, between governments, between communities, and between uh, nation states. It is from the Charter of the Khalif Umar that one establishes that the rights of non-Muslims within an Islamic state are protected. Religious conflicts, particularly between Muslims and Christians in countries like Nigeria and Sudan, have raised concerns about the implementation of Sharia law. Quite often, it is situations like these where Islamic laws are abused by a minority to the detriment of the rest of the Muslim world. The right to religious freedom, thought and expressions are to be respected and guaranteed in Islamic countries. The right to freedom of religion is a paradigm which underpins the Sharia and that has to be respected and protected. So a person who is a, not of the Islamic faith falls within that category of firstly to be respected for his own beliefs, secondly to be protected for that and to be given the necessary means to continue to practice his faith. So it's wrong for people of one or the other to burn down churches or religious institutions or mosques or synagogues. It's severely condemned and is an act of criminal conduct. So one can't say that the, the actions that are carrying on in, in many parts of the world, I mean, whether they're in Europe or in India or Pakistan or Nigeria or Sudan, is because of any religious convictions. That's simply because of aberrations or emotions and um, behaviors seem to be aroused by political interests of one group or the other. They, they have no justification at all from, from the point of the Sharia or Islam. It has been stated that the increase in lawlessness and serious crime in South Africa has now manifested itself to such a disturbing degree that the framework and the very existence of society is threatened with collapse. The unique position enjoyed by Muslim countries in controlling crime is evident from a review of the 1994 Interpol International Crime Statistics. Eight of the 15 countries with the lowest crime rates in the world in 1994 were Muslim countries. The criminal justice system of any country which fails to guarantee for its citizens the confidence that they can pursue their daily lives in peace and safety soon loses credibility in the eyes of the citizens. A large percentage of South Africans are of the view that the legal system has not satisfied their need for justice in that those who commit serious offences have not been visited with corresponding sentences. Despite South Africa's new constitution, many frustrated and angry citizens are of the opinion that the death penalty should be reinstated. My personal view is that if the death penalty were to be reimposed in